For the longest time, the most popular video on this channel has been about the end of ZDDP. In that video, I explored why ZDDP is so popular, especially among engine oil enthusiasts, why it's used in hydraulic oil so much, why is it so effective, and why is it so inexpensive. So the reason it's, it's so widely used is because it's cheap to make and it operates as a very effective anti-wear molecule and an effective antioxidant. And that makes it extraordinarily popular. But there are downsides, right? The phosphorus and the sulfur that are contained in the molecule poison catalysts. There are concerns about their environmental footprint. And so as a result, we're always looking for alternatives. But up until now, there's not been a credible alternative because although there are products like graphene or these fullerene style molecules um, or even you know, boron derivatives uh, that can mimic the, the same properties or even ionic fluids, the problem with these is that they're all very, very expensive. ZDDP is so cheap because one, the components that make it are relatively inexpensive, but also it has immense scale. It being the most popular additive in the world makes it cheap. Also, we have a long history. I mean, this molecule was developed in World War II or around that time. And so we had a lot of time to be able to refine it and better understand how it works in different formulations. So that's the challenge. Now, about four years ago, I had a conversation with one of the lead formulators of Mobile, and he let slip the fact that a company called Paramins, which is now Infinium, actually developed a copper-based PIBSA molecule, which was very effective. The problem was it was relatively expensive to produce, and as my understanding goes, it sort of went away. Another hint that he dropped, though, was that one of the hydraulic oils in the mobile range, it doesn't exist anymore, uh, didn't have a copper passivator in it, and what would often happen is that the uh, copper in oil coolers on hydraulic systems would swap out for zinc and it would make a copper DDP. Apparently, it was a very effective anti-wear molecule. And so my curiosity was kind of piqued. Uh, in fact, I did another video on copper uh, a couple of years ago on this channel. And mostly it was around copper contamination of oils. But I did actually draw, drop some hints that uh, copper could be used as an effective anti-wear additive and that there was a decent amount of research going on, mainly in China, around using copper oleates as an anti-wear additive. Now, to my surprise, a little while ago, a company based out of the UK called Neol got in contact with me to say that they were working on a similar technology and would I like to know more? So, given my background, Absolutely, I jumped on a plane to Jakarta to meet up with the team and understand a little bit more about how their technology works. And their technology is very, very surprising because although it's a copper-based anti-wear additive, it's based on organic copper salts. And they are claiming right, that you can make a diesel engine oil that contains no saps, so no sulfur, no phosphorus, no ash, and no TBM. That violates everything that I understand to be true about engine oils because combustion produces acids. You need bases to neutralize those acids. And if you don't have those bases, then you run into a whole bunch of issues with things like uh, copper corrosion in you know, bearings and things like that. So how exactly does this technology work? And so I had them explain it to me. And the best way to learn is to teach. And so here is my explanation of how their technology works. So we're all aware of a phenomenon that is known as hydrogen embrittlement. And that's where hydrogen under high pressure invades itself into the metals. And it usually um, kind of aligns itself with the grain structure of the metals. And then what we get is hydrogen embrittlement. So it weakens the surface of the metals and it makes them susceptible to failure. But there's also a phenomenon which is called hydrogen wear. Now this is a wear mechanism that I had never heard of and I was very surprised, not that I know everything, but I was surprised that there's a wear mechanism that I haven't really heard of. Now I kind of put some feelers out to a few tribology folks in the community and they said, yeah, you know, hydrogen wear, there was a whole bunch of research that was done about that in sort of like the 1970s and then it sort of went away. Well, as it turns out, it didn't go away. It was just studied a lot more in Eastern Europe than it was anywhere else. And so there was actually a rich vein of kind of scholarship um, that I had to get translated from Russian into English to explain the hydrogen wear mechanisms. I did actually find a paper written by someone from Poland um, which explained the hydrogen wear mechanism as well. And so it seems like there's an entire vein of research that um, hasn't really existed in the West. Now, 
Hydrogen wear, I don't think, is responsible for the vast majority of wear, right? We still have our traditional adhesive wear and abrasive wear mechanisms and corrosive wear, cavitation, all that sort of stuff. But it is a contributing factor. And what is interesting about Neil's technology is that they say that they are using hydrogen wear to make their anti-wear film. So I had to know a little bit more. So their idea is that if you have a bearing which is rotating near a surface, right, there is hydrogen in the oil and uh, in water that is contained in the oil. Now, when I tell you that under pressure, right, uh, what we have is basically hydrogen breaking off the molecules and invading the top layers of the surface, right? Now, this sounds a lot similar to what we would call white etch cracking. And that's a, you know, that is known to occur in things like wind turbines. So under very, very high pressure, the molecules actually break, we get free hydrogen, which invades the surface. And so what we call white edge cracking, they are calling hydrogen wear, and they are suggesting that this phenomenon is actually much more common than we might think. So what's actually happening at the microstructure? Okay, so so all metals are crystals, and if you can imagine iron is, is set up as kind of a crystal lattice, yes, this is a very basic representation, but effectively what happens is that the hydrogen gets into the metals, and once it's there, it increases the internal pressure, and it's able to generate cracks. Now, these cracks are actually subsurface initiated, and once they reach the surface, then you get the formation of an actual wear particle, which then ends up in the flow stream. Now, the question is, why on earth are we using copper to develop this anti-wear layer? So the idea is that as the metal is removed, now the organic copper salts lay themselves down and they become sort of like the anti-wear layer in place of something like a ZDDP. Now, our question is, why do we have to use copper? Why are we not using any other kind of metal? And why is copper considered a bit of a breakthrough here? Well, the reason is, because if you look at the reactivity series of metals, um, look at everything on the left, right? These are common metals which are used in the manufacturing of equipment. Now, magnesium's a little bit more rare, but you know, Porsche, for example, made some uh, magnesium-based crankcases in the 70s. Then you've got aluminium, which is very common in pistons. I've put zinc in here because it's the thing that we're comparing to as an anti-wear additive. Iron is obviously everywhere. And then you've got nickel and tin, which are very common in things like engine bearings. Then we've got hydrogen. And you can notice that hydrogen sits to the right of all of those metals. So it's more reactive. What do we have to the right of hydrogen? There's things like copper silver, gold, and then if you keep going out to the right, there's platinum and palladium. So we face a little bit of an issue. Most of the common metals that we use in things like additive packages and in the materials that we use to build machinery, they are more reactive than hydrogen. And on the right, most of the uh, things that we could use to solve this problem, which are less reactive than hydrogen, are unfortunately very, very expensive. So copper kind of hits this sweet spot where it is both relatively inexpensive and at the same time, it is able to stop this hydrogen wear phenomenon. All right, so that's a great theoretical explanation for how this technology works and how it deposits that sort of anti-wear layer. The problem is, I don't know if it actually works in the real world. Now, the folks at Neo convinced me that they've done plenty of trials and they have demonstrated the performance in the real world. And so what I wanted to do is, is take this to the trial stage. Right, so let's do it in a very controlled environment so that we can see the benefits. And the traditional foot, uh, path to doing this is very well mapped out. What you do is you start with a very small engine, so something like a motorbike engine, put it on a test stand, run it, see what the performance is like. And if it's good, then you progress up to something like a really big truck engine. And so that's what we're gonna do, right? Over the next little while, we're gonna progressively prove whether this technology actually works and whether it's a credible alternative to ZDDP. More importantly, we're going to see if this no saps formulation actually works. Because if this is true, and you can actually make a diesel engine oil with no saps, that's actually pretty revolutionary to be able to make an engine oil that has no TBN and no saps. So needless to say, I'm still a little bit skeptical, but I'm willing and I'm hoping to be proven wrong.